Jesus is the one that presents the rapture. It's not some doctrine from the Plymouth Brethren. Jesus is the one that talks about the rapture. And in this section, I'm going to go over it. The rapture is not the second coming. When Jesus ascended up from the Mount of Olives with his disciples, he went up. Do you remember what he was doing in Luke 24? It says in Luke 24 that he was blessing his disciples. Then we get to Acts chapter 1, which exactly is the very next event. And the angels say, this same Jesus that you saw going into heaven is going to come back in the same way for you. How does 2 Thessalonians 1.7 say Jesus' second coming is going to be? It says, in flaming fire taking vengeance on those that know not God. When Jesus comes in the second coming, he's incinerating people. It's just horrible carnage. The second coming is not the same as the rapture. The rapture is a glorious, wonderful thing. So those foundational truths are taught by Christ. Number one, it's a source of comfort. We're looking forward to his return. Number two, it's going to be like his ascension in Luke 24. Number three, it's an intentional rescue. He said, I'm keeping you from the hour. And that's a promise that the early church held to. How does Jesus describe what he's rescuing us from? I love this. Jesus said that he's coming to keep us from the hour of tribulation that's coming on the whole earth. What does that hour look like? It's an intentional rescue from the tribulation. Jesus promised believers they would be rescued from the whole world holocaust. Here's what's coming on the earth. It says in Revelation 6, 8, first of all, that a fourth of all the people die, and then warfare starts. And by the way, it says that a fourth of all people die through beasts of the earth. And it's not talking about alligators and lions. It's talking most likely because Anton von Leeuwenhoek, the guy that invented the microscope, the first time that this Dutch um, glassmaker looked through his microscope, he looked at one drop of water and he said, whoa, behold the beasties. Now he wasn't talking about the beastie boys, you know, a rock group. He's talking about the creatures in the water. And so when the Bible, they picked up that word beasts, but most of the beasts of the earth are not elephants and tigers. They're microorganisms. And it's most possible that part of the tribulation will be these vast plagues. There was an article in the New York Times three days ago that said the terrorist greatest dream is to export plagues on airplanes. And so because... Four billion people board airplanes every year, and there's only seven billion on the planet. You could easily, you know, get everybody in on some plague and spread it. So the whole world becomes a battlefield. The whole world faces starvation. Have you ever thought about the genetically modified stuff that we're eating? Have you ever tried to grow a squash from one that you got at the market and you save the seeds? It doesn't grow. We are coming to the place where if anything happens to our technological chain, there's going to be severe food shortages. So everything the tribulation says, you can see it coming. The whole world becomes a grass fire. It says that a third of all the green plants and trees die. Uh, it says that, and by the way, all the fish of the sea die. Uh, we stop to see the red tide on the coast. And everywhere we walked, I mean, the, those puffer fish and the, the crabs were all wobbly and dying and the uh, sand dollars were coming out of the ground. Those little snaky things that are in the sand that are about that long were just, I mean, dozens of them dead. And it, Bonnie and I were talking, I said, honey, this is just like Revelation 6 says, the horrors that are coming. The whole world faces what would be described as a nuclear winter uh, when it just a third of the sun, a third of the moon, a third of the stars and it's the Lord describing kind of like this fallout from uh, the warfare and, and all of the plagues. And then the horror show, chapter 9, there are demon creatures that are part of the rebellion against God that are so malignant, they're so powerful, that they destroy people so fast that God keeps them locked up because they're so powerful. One of them 
is actually called the destroyer. Abaddon is uh, the name of that angel, the destroyer. And he was the one that went through Egypt. He's called the angel of death. He went through Egypt and in one night found the firstborn human and the firstborn animal. Did you know the U.S. Special Forces, with every gizmo we had, could never go through any place and find the firstborn the firstborn. You'd have to poke them, do DNA, do a test, you know, and then check everybody else out and find who's the firstborn. That angel could tell who was the firstborn human and firstborn of the livestock and killed them silently. Angels are very powerful. God lets them out of the pit in chapter 9. They're actually here in earth incarcerated in a pit. They can't get out until that moment. Oh, the whole world becomes a nightmare. But that's why the church and Israel have distinct roles. We are part of the church. We're supposed to be a light to the world sharing the gospel until we're taken out and then Israel takes over. Where's the rapture in Revelation? The rapture in Revelation is right where I showed you in Philadelphia, kept from the hour. It's also in chapter 4 where he says, come up here. And if you notice, the church is mentioned over 20 times in chapter 1, 2, and 3 and never mentioned again. That's significant. Where'd it go? It went around the throne. And all of the saints, the redeemed saints, are worshiping the Lord. The rapture is not Christ's second coming. Jesus always describes his second coming around Israel. The whole context of Matthew 24 is Israel. It's, it's postured that you're living over there and looking at Jerusalem, and when you see the temple defiled, run to the hills. It's for Israel. But Jesus is the key to the blessed hope. 